Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mark Baker. I was president in 2015 and 2016. And I think Hupo accomplished a lot in those two years. Uh, we launched the Human Proteome Project in 2010. And in 2015 to 2016, the two areas I think we grew most were we established a very strong early career research encouragement scheme that's brought the young people into Hupo and brought young science and new ideas forward. And the second thing I think that uh, we accomplished in that time was to realise that to transfer the knowledge that we've made in the laboratories to, under the chromosome human, human proteome project or the biology and disease human proteome project, we had to transfer that knowledge both to the public and to other scientists. So we focused on knowledge transfer. So I think they're two of the major accomplishments the society made in that time. What are the major challenges you've faced during your presidency? <laughs> uh, as my two colleagues here will tell you, there are many challenges you face uh, uh, running an organisation that has almost 2,000 members and over 3,000 members on Hupo LinkedIn. So we have a pretty substantial uh, outreach to the scientific community at large. I think some of the challenges are to try and get consensus when there are many opinions. Um, I think that's one of the great things about being a president is you, you see the breadth and depth of differences of human experiences and human opinions and you, you get to see people who are uh, extremely talented at dealing with those difficult problems. So yeah, I think the, the, there were challenges everywhere, um, but you know, I, I was very positive that we could, do, could deal with those. I think we furthered the HPP a little bit under things started under Mark's initiative. Um, I think we've uh, made quite a few advancements in the annotations and uh, reorganized the BD a little bit. Um, I think the biggest thing perhaps though is starting to get proteomics integrated into these very large scale projects. For example, Motor Pack is a $170 million US initiative to study the effect of exercise and it now has a large proteomics component as part of that. So I think um, starting to get proteomics on the you know, visibility scale is a good thing so that Hupo really maximizes its impact. Would you like to mention any challenges which you faced during your presidency? Yeah, well one other thing I could add too, I think we've started to get better gender, um, gender equity uh, under my term. I think uh, challenges that we still have more to do there, quite a bit more. Uh, and I think another accomplishment I should say is that we elected Steve, which is a be my legacy probably. <laughs> um, other challenges are I do think we have a long ways to go too about getting proteomics top of mind on everyone's mind so because I think it is uh, a field that's capable of having enormous impact and I don't think that's been fully realized yet and I think I'm sure Steve will pick that one up and run with it. Yeah so I'm going to be president from 2019 and, and to include 2020. Uh, I think that during that period we're going to have two more fantastic World Congresses. Uh, my major aims, I think, as, as President, really will be to support the activities of the organisation, but also its individual members. So really to support the activities of the HPP, and obviously that the HPP is undergoing a really important transition phase now, as it moves to a new leader, um, and to support the activities of the individual members. And I think one of the key things that they require, or may want assistance with, is, is re the resourcing of their activities. So their research activities, whether they're in technology development or biological research or the application of that research. And so and anything that the society can do to support them uh, and grow the resourcing of proteomics projects, both small scale and very large ones, uh, I think will be, would be a key achievement. We've seen in, in you know, some of the uh, initiatives that Mike's mentioned there in the US and there are equivalent initiatives in Europe and I'm sure there will be in Australasia and we've seen some large scale investments in Australia in proteomics activities. And it's, so it's anything I can do to support the organisation, support the members to, to engage with those major initiatives. Uh, so that's one. Uh, and I think the other then is to improve uh, the engagement of proteomics with other communities, both scientific communities, our clinical colleagues, but also increase public engagement and awareness of proteomics activities. Yeah, good question. Um, my research personally is trying to make an impact in the field of precision medicine uh, and in particular we're trying to uh, solve two major problems the early detection of colon cancer which affects about 1.4 million 
uh, people on the planet every year and detect that earlier using a blood test that um, allows you then to have a highly confirmatory, very accurate colonoscopy and then surgery if you're diagnosed sadly with that disease because we know that survival is, is at a much higher rate uh, when you're detected early. And the second is to be able to detect patients who are at high risk of recurrence of the disease from those that are cured by their original surgery if we do detect the disease earlier. So it's very important because at present we don't have proteomic or genomic techniques that allow us either early detection or stratification of those people that need chemotherapy or that are cured by surgery. Yes, it's interesting you mention that because uh, um, QPO has just launched pathology as one of the pillars on which it relies for its biology and disease uh, initiatives and its chromosome initiatives. And uh, pathology is absolutely integral in our work, in fact, uh, both blood-based detection of, of disease in screening tests and uh, immunohistochemistry tests that tell you whether or not a patient is at high risk. Both of those are fundamental tools that pathologists use. So we, our team actually has six pathologists involved in the work and uh, we've been working with them now for over almost two decades. Yeah, our biggest push is in the area of big data and multiomics profiling of people for mostly focus on trying to understand health and then transition to disease, catch disease early before it's symptomatic. Uh, we're very big on longitudinal profiling, to, so following people over time because we think the biggest way to detect disease is by following people individually and finding that delta, that shift, that first period where people start becoming ill, there'll be molecular signatures. So that's our push. We try to use as many data types as possible, including uh, proteomics, which we think will be very powerful in this endeavor. As far as pathology is concerned, everything we do involves pathology. All the samples we collect, um, and some new ones, I would argue, will have to fall into pathology, i.e. your microbiome, your stool samples should get incorporated into that. Anyway, all the samples we collect, they're all part of pathology, and so it's a great new initiative that is part of HUPO. I think it's going to be very integral to everything we do. Yeah, so the HPOP project is a phenomenally exciting project. Uh, it's one we launched three years ago, initially at Taipei, then Dublin, which Steve ran, and now here we are in Orlando. We're taking our third round of samples. We're profiling everybody who comes to visit uh, who, and volunteers. We get them, get them during the meeting where they give their blood, urine, and stool samples. And now we're going to do deep profiling right after this meeting, generate tons of data, get it back to people, and just see how people differ from all around the world. It'll be a little, pretty exciting project. We'll get to see, again, how these different corners of the people from different corners of the world compare to one another. And it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, so I think you're right. There have been very many biomarkers discovered and, and obviously our expectation is that because so many proteins are used as integral and really significant in important parts of existing diagnostic tests, that proteins will be a critical central role of future diagnostic tests. Those tests probably will incorporate other analytes, so they will come from multi-omics data sets, kinds of data sets that Mike and Mark have been working with and generating. Uh, we haven't been particularly successful in doing that, and so I think that what that tells us are that there are many roadblocks. How we overcome those roadblocks, I think from a HUPO perspective, is by greater engagement of the people who've done the discovery with those individuals who can translate them. And so that means greater engagement with the clinical community, greater engagement with the clinical diagnostics community, and obviously, ultimately, greater engagement with the commercialization community. So greater engagement with those communities and I think we've reached a stage now in HUPO and the activities of the HUPO members and proteomics in general where there's increasing recognition that the work we do, have done has served as a foundation for the next stage of the development of those uh, biomarkers. Well I, I'm pretty sure I speak for my colleagues it's very exciting for I love it it's uh, it's something that turns you on discovering how proteins are integral to human life to human health and disease. And uh, I think being involved in the pursuit of biomarkers that can alleviate human suffering is, is probably the most honourable thing one can do. So I'd encourage young people, it's exciting, it's uh, great. Proteomics is uh, part of the team that's, that's going to make up precision medicine in the next hundred years or so, along with genomics and metabolomics and the microbiome and all of the other omics and ologies that uh, are on offer. So uh, 
basically take that multidisciplinary approach forward in, in your scientific career and more importantly have fun. Yeah, I agree. There's never been a more exciting time to be in science than now. It's amazing all the things you can do where you can follow thousands of proteins and bodily fluids and um, really understand biology at a level that's never been possible before. And I think then, as Mark says, to be able to take that knowledge and actually apply it to understanding disease and, and ideally ameliorating disease is going to be incredibly powerful and important. And quite frankly, everyone who enters science now has that opportunity to do that. It's just an amazing time. Yeah, so I think I'd, I'd echo both of those comments. I suppose my, my major thing would be to say I think you're really lucky. Uh, really lucky to be able to be a scientist at the beginning of a career in an age, in the age that it is now, you know, and so I'm slightly envious. I wish I were 30 years younger and could start <laughs> so out again from, the, from this particular, not just to be younger, but from the point that we're at now, because the opportunities are huge and enormous. And I think that increasingly they're not bounded by traditional things that it was when we were doing, maybe starting out our science, was that you worked in one specific discipline. Now the opportunity to move across and between disciplines and incorporate other disciplines into the work you're doing to operate as multidisciplinary teams, I think is really uh, engaging and powerful. Yeah, you're only limited by your imagination. Yeah, it is. All right, so thank you so much Thanks. for uh, <laughs> sharing the vision. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.